Welcome to Korean True Crime with me, your host, Mimi Mizigo. The 1982 massacre perpetrated by police officer Woo bung remains one of the worst mass shootings in history, even to this day. It held the record for the shortest duration of a mass shooting in the Guinness Book of World Records until 2011. Woo bung coldly walked house by house, killing all in his path in a murder spree that would be remembered in infamy. Thank you so much to Vix Mack, Lala, Jay Colomo, Ben Jones, Ashley Rigby, William White, Sue VB Van Bremen, Blanca Blanca, G1 Edwards, Selkie, Nico, Elijah Hancock, Anominom, Dr. Bob, My96, and Lumos for their support on Patreon. Thank you for voting on today's episode topic. If you'd like to join my patrons, you'll receive ad-free early access episodes, weekly Korean true crime vocabulary hinting at the content of the next episode, exclusive access to vote on future episode topics, and occasional bonus content. There are no tiers, so all patrons gain access to everything. If you'd like to support me with your love, find me on most social media sites at Korean True Crime. Sources are available for free on Patreon. Warning, today's episode contains mass killings involving guns. Listener discretion is advised. Woo Bum Gun was born in 1955 and spent his childhood in the coastal city of Busan. As a child, he showed very little interest in academic pursuits. He frequently skipped school and struggled to establish meaningful friendships. Both teachers and classmates perceived him as short-tempered and prone to violence. He often engaged in arguments and instigated fights, resulting in difficulty making and keeping friends. As he entered high school, Bum Gun's academic performance declined, eventually leading him to transfer to a technical school. School. Unfortunately, his life took a drastic turn when his father passed away suddenly during his third year of high school. The nature of his relationship with his parents is unknown, but the loss of his father seemed to profoundly affect his mental well-being. His grades continued to plummet, eventually leading him to drop out of high school altogether before completing his education. Woo Bum Gun's life took a positive turn when he commenced his military service with the Korean Marine Corps, specializing in marksmanship. He discovered a sense of stability and happiness during this period. His exceptional shooting skills garnered recognition, leading to a promotion and assignment at the prestigious Blue House, the official residence of the president or leader of South Korea. Unfortunately, his promising trajectory was cut short due to his inherently violent disposition. He frequently engaged in arguments and physical altercations with fellow soldiers, compounded by a severe dependence on alcohol that began to hinder his performance. The consumption of alcohol only exacerbated his aggressive tendencies. His reputation for unruly behavior earned him the derogatory nickname Crazy Tiger. As his actions became problematic for his superiors, he was deemed unfit for his position and subsequently demoted from the Marine Corps. Within a mere eight months of his promotion, he found himself transferred to the Gungyu Police Station. It was in 1981 that Woo Bang Gun received his demotion. The early 1980s was a very dystopian time for the people of South Korea. President Chan Hoo Won had orchestrated a coup d'etat to seize power and promptly declared martial law. As a result, opposition leaders were arrested, schools were shut down, all forms of political activity was banned, and media outlets were suppressed. These unsettling circumstances eventually led to the Gwangju Uprising, a significant event in the nation's history. Although Korean true crime has yet to cover this pivotal moment in history, it does remain something worth exploring. If you're interested in hearing an episode about the Gwangju Uprising, let me know on Patreon. Consequently, within that year, Korea underwent a dramatic transformation into a highly militaristic dictatorship, marked by civilian military clashes and guerrilla warfare unfolding throughout the country. Uobam Gun was a part of this military. At the age of 26, on December 30th, 1981, Woo Bum Gun arrived at the Gongyu police station located in the sparsely populated village inside Weiryang. This village, both then and now, ranks among the least populated county in South Korea, making his demotion all the more insulting. He was relegated to the role of a police officer in a community with fewer than 100 households, and to this day, the population of the area remains fewer than 25,000 people. After residing in the village for about a month, in February 1982, 
he began dating his next door neighbor, whom we can refer to as Yuju. Their relationship progressed, leading them to eventually move in together. However, Yuju's family disapproved of their cohabitation, particularly due to Pumkan's uncontrollable drinking. It was widely known amongst those who acquainted with him that alcohol was fueling his fights and profanity. Despite Yuju's family efforts to dissuade her from living with him before marriage, Pumgan insisted on postponing their marriage until after the fall, citing financial constraints that prevented them from having a nice wedding. Yuju eventually decided to move in with Bumgan despite her family's wishes, but they were planning an extravagant wedding in the future. Because Bumgan grew up in a very modest way, he harbored a strong desire to escape his lifestyle and felt really embarrassed by his perceived lack of wealth. Later, he would express feelings of incompetence due to the inexpensive apartment they lived in and his modest salary. On April 26, 1982, the month following their move in together, Ubam Gun came home from his night shift at noon, had lunch, and went to sleep. While he was sleeping, Yuju noticed a fly buzzing around their apartment. For some reason, she impulsively decided to strike the fly the moment it landed on his chest. This abrupt awakening sent him into an uncontrollable rage. Yuju later would testify about his uncontrollable temper. Bum Gun started an argument that escalated into a lengthy fight that he struggled to calm down from. Eventually, Eventually, at around 4 p.m., unable to calm down, he stormed out of their home. When Bumcon returned home at 7.30 p.m., he was heavily intoxicated. He discovered that Yuju had invited her sister over to their house. The argument reignited, and Yuju's sister supported her in the dispute. It was during this altercation that Bumcon struck Yuju's sister, causing her nose to bleed. Yuju attempted to defend her sister, but ended up being hit by Bumgan as well. The commotion attracted the attention of neighbors, some of whom were Yuju's family members. The women informed them about the incident, to which Bumgan fled the apartment, still wearing his police uniform. Bumgan proceeded to the police station, where he encountered another officer from the military police force who was stationed in the village. Still consumed by anger, he engaged in a heated argument with the fellow officer. In a retaliatory outburst, the officer who happened to be Yuju's younger brother exclaimed, you're not even a real police officer. Without hesitation, Ubam Gan made his way to the weapons locker, loaded an M2 carbine rifle, and fatally shot the other officer. The missing inventory from the weapons locker indicates that Bum Gan had taken two M2 carbine rifles, 144 rounds of ammunition, and eight grenades. After leaving the police station at 9.40 p.m., Ubam Gan encountered a man in his 20s walking in the opposite direction along the road. Without hesitation, Bumgan approached the man and fatally shot him, displaying a complete absence of remorse or hesitation. His anger had transformed into a homicidal rage. Continuously moving forward, he proceeded through a marketplace where he encountered three individuals who had stayed behind after the market had closed. In a chilling manner, he callously took their lives. Bumgan swiftly departed the scene and continued toward the post office, where he discovered two phone operators and a postman on duty. He proceeded to shoot and kill all three individuals. However, he did not immediately flee the post office. He had a very specific motive for targeting this location. Bumgan had deliberately chosen the post office because it housed the telephone switchboards for the entire town. He destroyed the machines and murdered the operators, effectively severing communication for the entire area. Remarkably, one of the switchboard operators managed to send an emergency signal to the chief of police's residence after being shot, before succumbing to her injuries. News reports at the time suggested that the first woman killed at the post office had previously rejected Bumgan's advances when he first arrived at town. However, such speculation appears to be mere gossip aimed at sensationalizing the case and shouldn't be considered as significant justification for his actions. In just less than five minutes, he had claimed the lives of eight people. By the time he left the police office, it was 9.45 p.m., no other officers were on duty at this time, as the police chief and other officers had gone to a sauna, known as a jimjabang. The police chief would not receive the alert immediately. 
After departing from the post office, Ubangan arrived in a small residential area at around 10 p.m. He began targeting homes with lights still illuminated. Initially, the occupants of the first home opened the door for him, presuming his police uniform signified safety. However, he soon resorted to breaking into homes, indiscriminately shooting anyone he encountered, including those attempting to escape upon hearing the sound of gunfire. This was his own neighborhood. He took the life of his landlord and fired upon his neighbors, including Yuju. In total, six more people lost their lives here, although Yuju thankfully survived her injuries. Tragically, though, she experienced the devastating loss of her entire family during the massacre. Merely 10 minutes elapsed before Bumgon departed from the area and proceeded further down the road, eventually reaching a nearby market. With each passing moment, his actions became increasingly reckless. Upon arriving at the market, he stopped at a shop to purchase a drink and then started harassing a teenage boy that was passing by. The boy was hesitant to talk to him and attempted to distance himself from Bumgun, who was drunken carrying a rifle on his shoulder. However, Bumgun rose to his feet and fatally shot the flame child. The sound of the gunshot attracted the attention of others in the market, prompting a dozen or so individuals to gather and investigate the commotion. Bumgon began shouting that the boy was a North Korean spy, exploiting the prevailing fear surrounding such matters in South Korea at the time. As a crowd formed, he indiscriminately opened fire, discharging his weapon haphazardly into the midst of the bystanders. He then proceeded to pull the pin from a grenade and threw it into the crowd. Tragically, 18 people lost their lives in the market. Bumgon killed without any semblance of conscience. As he was prepared to depart, he heard the cry of a baby, a lone survivor amidst the chaos. Upon hearing the baby's cries, Bumgon callously remarked, Is there something here that hasn't died yet? The infant's life was also cut short. Survivors hid in shops, afraid that they would be next. Amongst the victims in the market were individuals who had been close to Bumgon and had considered him a friend. By the time he was witnessed leaving the market, merely an hour had elapsed since he had begun, and he had already claimed the lives of 29 people. Continuing his rampage, Ubamgun proceeded through the town until he stumbled upon a home that was holding funeral rites at around 10.50 p.m. The family, along with others visiting their home, were taken aback to see Bumgun enter the home dressed in uniform armed with a rifle. He attempted to pacify their concerns by claiming that he had responded to an emergency, but wanted to pay his respects before returning home for the night. He spent some time with the grieving family, even offering monetary contributions in accordance with funeral customs. They shared drinks together for approximately 10 minutes until someone remarked that he had consumed enough alcohol that night. Upset by this comment, Pumgon erupted in anger when a man questioned his choice to drink during not only a mourning ritual, but also while being on duty. The man scolded him for being disrespectful at their home. In response, Bumgon retrieved the gun and began shooting indiscriminately at everyone inside the house. Some individuals managed to escape, including the adult son of the deceased, who had already lost his father the week prior. Tragically, at the funeral, he lost his mother, three of his own children, and a young nephew. The surviving son was forced to hold multiple funerals simultaneously and endured such severe PTSD that it resulted in a speech impediment, evoking even greater sympathy when his testimony was broadcast on television. Among all of the victims, his story remained particularly poignant and heart-wrenching. A total of 12 people lost their lives at the home, and as Bumgun moved to nearby houses, the death toll reached 23, bringing his murder spree to a total of 52 victims. During his rampage, a taxi driver witnessed him shooting an individual outside of a home and quickly embarked on a desperate mission to warn others, running from door to door shouting, turn off your lights and hide. Unfortunately, the brave taxi driver was shot by bum gun before he could reach most of the houses, but many survivors heard him and managed to stay safe by following his instructions and turning off their lights as Bumgun was only approaching homes with illuminated interiors. The courageous taxi driver, whose name remains concealed amongst other victims' names, undoubtedly saved numerous lives that night. As he continued his rampage, an emergency alarm suddenly sounded throughout the village at 3.40 a.m. It was then that he arrived at the Sa family's home. Waking the five family members, he held them hostage at gunpoint, 
In the process, he murdered two of the family members and ultimately would kill all of the family members as well as himself by detonating two grenades in the home. Within just a matter of hours, the death toll had reached 62 victims, with an additional 33 individuals sustaining injuries. Tragically, six of those succumbed to their injuries while receiving treatment at a hospital. Perhaps you're wondering why no other police officers responded to the incident. It so happened that the chief of police was not present at his home when the alert came through from the switchboard operator. The initial report, which was transmitted at 9.45, was just an alarm. But later, a report would be sent by a survivor describing Ubangan as an armed assailant indiscriminately shooting civilians in the street. However, the report would not reach the chief of police until 10.24 p.m., around the time that Bumgun was throwing grenades in the marketplace. During my research for this episode, I came across various forms of media that embellished or mistranslated the details of the case. It happens. However, what frustrates me the most is the lack of discussion surrounding the incompetence and corruption among the officers whose duty it was to protect the citizens of the village. Upon receiving the news of the emergency, the police chief callously expressed relief that he wasn't on duty that night and was safely away from the village. He was glad that he wasn't there. Instead of taking immediate action, he chose to flee to a location outside of town, prioritizing his own safety. The chief informed the other officers about the situation who then gathered together. Equipped with military gear from the arsenal, they loaded into military vehicles and drove towards the outskirts of town, positioning themselves on a bridge. Their intention was not to stop Ubangan's murderous spree, but simply to prevent him from leaving the city limits. It's important to note that there are numerous trained police officers here, familiar with military tactics and equipped with riot gear, who opted not to confront a lone man armed with a rifle due to their own fear for personal safety. Instead of identifying Bumgan's whereabouts and taking immediate action, the officers confessed that they were terrified of being shot while navigating the dark, unpaved roads of the small village. The police chief eventually joined the officers at the bridge around 1.20 a.m. during a lull in Bumgun's shootings. Rather than ordering a coordinated effort to apprehend the perpetrator and save more lives, they retreated to the safety of the police station, barricading themselves inside and activating the police siren from within. The village's speakers blared a siren typically used in cases of guerrilla warfare, as the public still harbored deep fear of North Korean soldiers and spies. The speakers broadcasted a military order, urging reserve military forces to help protect the city. The timing of the siren coincided with Ubangan's frantic decision to take a family hostage and ultimately take his own life. It is believed that the military siren echoing throughout the otherwise silent village heard only by surviving victims hiding with their deceased loved ones triggered a paranoid spiral in Baumgun's mind, leading him to believe that soldiers were finally coming to stop him. Faced with the perceived imminent threat, he made the final choice to take his own life, avoiding the consequences of his heinous actions. It is believed that if the warning had been broadcasted throughout the village immediately upon the initial call for help, more than half of the victims could have been saved. The piercing siren may have frightened Bumgan into thinking that the police were mobilizing to put an end to his rampage, yet they did not take action until much, much later in the early morning. At 2 a.m., two villagers sought refuge in the mountains and encountered soldiers near the town's outskirts. They pleaded with the police chief to send in the soldiers who were equipped with military gear. However, the chief refused to send in the soldiers, citing the dark night and poor visibility as reasons why it would be too perilous to send them into the streets. By 3.40 a.m., when Uba Mugan took his own life, the soldiers were still stationed fearfully at the bridge just outside of town. Even 20 minutes after the massacre had ended, the chief of police remained unaware of its conclusion. It wasn't until 4 a.m. when riot police from Masan and Jinju, both located approximately an hour away by car, arrived and they confirmed Bumgan's demise. 
The majority of information regarding this incident remained concealed from the public for an extended period due to the military dictatorship's efforts to cover up the police's misconduct. The government strictly controlled what the press could report, and they were hesitant to shed light on the incident as it could reflect poorly on President Chan Tu Hwan. While there were a few vaguely mentioned articles in newspapers initially, they quickly disappeared, and there was no significant coverage or public attention given to the case. However, in the past decade, the incident has garnered widespread interest as people have become more fascinated with crime history. Because we're reliant on survivor testimonies, there are gaps in the narrative regarding what transpired during the periods when Ubangan roamed the town. The Supreme Court records list 55 individuals killed, while the city reports indicate that the murder spree claimed the lives of 62 people. As of 2023, the city has not yet erected a memorial dedicated to the victims, but the community comes together annually to conduct ancestral rites in remembrance of the victims. The 41st memorial took place on April 26, 2023. The victims of the massacre include six individuals under the age of 10, tragically including the newborn baby. The small village was populated by tightly knit families who had lived together for generations, owning extensive plots of land. They were descendants of long-standing clans that had historical ties to the area. The devastating impact of the massacre was far-reaching, as for some of the victims, it marked the end of their entire bloodline. Among the victims was a man who had just visited his fiancée, one of the switchboard operators at the post office. Both were tragically killed, and their grieving families held a soul wedding ceremony during their joint funeral. Another victim was the postman, who lost his life alongside his wife, who worked at the marketplace. Their three children were left orphaned on that fateful night. In the aftermath of the tragedy, villagers expressed their deep anguish by protesting and voicing their grievances against the police and the military. They were not only angered by the failure of the police to protect their loved ones, but also by the prevailing indifference of the military police towards their communities. It was a common occurrence for police officers to neglect their scheduled duties without obtaining permission. On the night of the massacre, three other officers were meant to be on duty in the town, but they had all left to attend various personal matters. The police chief himself had departed without authorization to visit a sauna, which facilitated Ubangan's access to the entire arsenal by overpowering the single fellow officer. As a result of this incident, the Minister of Home Affairs resigned, and No Te U, a close associate of President Chan Tu Huan, was appointed to the position. No Te U later leveraged this appointment to ascend to the presidency. In the subsequent legal proceedings, the Supreme Court ultimately acquitted the officers of dereliction of duty, ruling that they could not be held accountable for abandoning their responsibilities. In light of such tragic events, it is crucial that we reflect on the importance of holding law enforcement accountable for their duties and ensuring the safety of the communities they serve. It is essential that we demand transparency, integrity, and professionalism from our law enforcement agencies. The protection of innocent lives should always be their paramount objective. When failures occur, it is imperative that a thorough investigation takes place and those responsible are held accountable, irrespective of rank or position. Moreover, we must remember and honor the lives lost in such a horrific event. Each victim had dreams, aspirations, and loved ones who continue to suffer from their absence. By commemorating their memory, we not only pay tribute to their lives, but also ensure that their stories are not forgotten. Their tragic experiences serve as a reminder of the importance of maintaining a just and safe society. Through collective remembrance, we can strive for a future where such senseless violence is prevented, where law enforcement is held to the highest standards of professionalism, and where the protection of every individual is a shared responsibility. Only by learning from the past and advocating for change can we create a safer and more compassionate world. Thank you so much for listening to Korean True Crime. I hope you enjoyed today's episode topic. If you'd like to vote on future episode topics, join Korean True Crime's Patreon today. If you'd like to hear more, follow the show wherever you listen and be sure to leave a review. 
If you'd like to send feedback, find me on all social media sites at Korean True Crime. See you next time.